This is the seventh day of this August 1987 day, Sashin. And today we will read from a book called Swampland, Swampland Flowers, the letters and lectures of Zen master Dawe. His biography could make a Taisho all its own, but we will not go into this today. today. Rather read from his letters, just a very few words about his life. He was born in 1088 during the Song Dynasty in China, and he died in 1163. He's very talented, very steeped and versed in the writings and scriptures. At the early age, he became what he called a lecturer's attendant. He was giving lectures, even was asked to talk to newcomers by his teacher. But there was a gnawing doubt in him all the time, and it must have always centered around death. What is death? What is dying? Very often at the beginning of the scene, we, we read one of Dawei's admonitions to find out who it is that dies, who is afraid of death. If you really want to find out what death is, you must dive deeply where thought can touch. His final teacher was Yuan Wu, who was the compiler of the Hekika no Roku, this famous collection of a hundred Zen koans. It's interesting that after Yuan Wu died, Dawe burnt the documents or whatever, the wood blocks, wherever they were collected. He burnt them because he felt it was such a tremendous danger. The danger he saw all around him that people would just be quoting and reciting and mouthing and not understanding. So these things had to be collected over and we don't quite have the original edition anymore because Dawei took that upon himself to do away with it. Yan Wu, the teacher, directed Dawi to spend time receiving and conversing with gentlemen of affairs who came calling. Whenever Dawi entered his room for private instruction, Yuan Wu brought up the same saying every time. Having words or wordlessness, both are like clinging vines on the tree. Questioning him with this one, we would immediately say, wrong, that's not it, as soon as Dawi opened his mouth. Dawi said, this truth is like a dog looking at a pan of hot oil, wanting to taste it, but unable to, wanting to get it, to give it up, but unable to give it up. Yuan Wu said, you've described it very well. This is the unbreakable trap, the thicket of thorns. So one day Dawei say, said to his teacher, I hear that when you were at your teacher's, Wutsu, you asked about the saying. I wonder what Wutsu said. <laughs> Yuan Wu laughed, but didn't answer. <laughs> Dawei said, at that time you must have asked it in front of the assembly. What's stopping you from saying it now? And Yuan Wu said, I ask the meaning of having words or wordlessness. Both are like clinging vines on the tree. Whereupon his teacher, Wu Tzu, said, Describe it, and it can't be described completely. Depict it, and it cannot be depicted accurately. And then the teacher, Yuan Wu, Dawei's teacher, continues asking, How is it when the tree falls and the vine withers? How is it when the tree falls and the vine withers? 
And Wutsu said, It comes along with it. At these words, Dawi was released, saying, I understand. Just one more thing about his dying. You know, in, in, in China and in Japan, masters always die with poems in their mouth. Beautiful poems at times. It's a tradition. It's the utter last poem. So here was 1163 on the ninth day of the eighth month after showing signs of illness when Dawei told the congregation of monks, nuns, and lay people Tomorrow I'm going. Towards the pre-dawn hours, after he'd written his last bequest and a letter to the emperor, the monk who was attendant, his attendant asked Dawi for a verse. After all, can't let him die without a verse. In a serious voice, Dawi said, without a verse I couldn't die. He took up the brush and he wrote, birth is thus. Death is thus. Verse or no verse, what's the fuss? <laughs> <laughs> then he let go of the writing brush and passed on. <laughs> He'd lived for 75 years. Just read these different selections. All of these selections that are read are letters to lay people. He was always in communication with what he often calls the gentlemen of affairs. Apparently high government officials and all kinds of people, also monks, nuns, wrote to him. We don't have their letters, but we have his answer, in which is quite evident most of the time what the letter was like. First one is called Clear the Mind. Buddha said, if you want to know the realm of Buddhahood, you must make your mind as clear as empty space and leave false thinking and all grasping far behind, causing your mind to be unobstructed wherever it may turn. False thinking always refers to the thinking that there is a me that needs to be fulfilled. The realm of Buddhahood is not some external world where there is a formal Buddha. It's the realm of wisdom of a self-awakened sage. Or we could say a self-awakened human being. Seeing clearly, which means no fears. And when there are no fears, then there are no illusions. Why do you need to drum up an illusion if you're not afraid? To stand alone. To be as you are. Not really knowing what you are. not fearing to see people as they are, then there's no need to build up illusions about people. In which the fear that they may not be so is not resolved. Once you're determined that you want to know this realm, you do not need adornment, cultivation, or realization to attain it. He must clear away the stains of affliction from alien sensations that have been on your mind since beginningless time. Not entrapping <coughs> all the rubbish, as one person put it. Which means to see the rubbish not to fall for, not to be taken on a rubbish ride. So 
so that your mind is as broad and open as empty space, detached from all the clinging of the discriminating intellect, and your false, unreal, vain thoughts, too, are like empty space. They may be there, but they're like empty space. One is not taking them for ride, for real and is taking for a ride on them. Then this wondrous, effortless mind will be unimpeded wherever it goes. Effortless because the energy is there. Listen to the wind in the trees. It's there. any place where it is not? This chapter is called, this letter is called Stillness and Commotion. Having read your letter carefully, I've come to know that you're unremitting in your conduct and that you're not carried away by the press of official duties. That in the midst of swift flowing streams, you vigorously examine yourself. In the midst of, in the midst of a swift flowing stream of official duties, you still vigorously examine yourself. Is that possible? Don't say it isn't, because then it won't be possible. But question whether it's possible and see. When you want to find out whether it's possible to examine yourself vigorously even in the midst of, a, of an office, and every once in a while you pay attention to whether it's possible or not, and that's attention. That's not being caught up in the stream completely. Far from being lax, your aspiration to the path grows even more firm as time goes on. You have fulfilled my humble wishes solidly and profoundly. <coughs> Nevertheless, worldly passions li are like a blazing fire. When will they ever end? Right in the midst of the hubbub, you mustn't forget the business of the bamboo chair and the reed cushion. We don't sit on bamboo chairs and reed cushions, we sit on this here, whatever it is. Usually, to meditate, you set your mind on a still concentration point, but you must be able to use it right in the midst of the hubbub. Not just think, well, a little bit later, I'll get to the sitting again. Can one become transparent to oneself in the midst of hubbub? That's the work of Zazen. That's the meaning of it, the real meaning of it. If you have no strength amidst commotion, after all it's as if, you, as if you never made an effort in stillness. I've heard that there was some complicated situation in the past and now you're experiencing the sadness of the outcome. Alone, you do not dare to hear your fate. If you arouse this thought, then it will obstruct the path. The arou arousing the thought, I don't want to think of that. I don't know. Uh, uh, I can't think of it. It's too painful. That's the obstruction. An ancient worthy said, if you can recognize the inherent nature while going along with the flow, there's neither joy nor sorrow. Let us say there's neither the thought of joy nor sorrow. But there's deeply felt joy and deeply felt sorrow without clinging or wallowing <coughs> or evading or escaping. This is living deeply like the elephant.
vulnerable. An elephant is a very vulnerable animal, very sensitive. No matter how thick that hide looks. That's why you find the elephant so much depicted in Eastern iconography. Vimalakirti said, he was a great layman at the time of the Buddha, it is like this. The high plateau does not produce lotus flowers. The high, beautiful meadows and the clear, unpolluted air, unpolluted soil, of the mountains does not produce the lotus. It is the mire of the low swamplands that produces these flowers. That's the fact. They grow out of mud. Dull. opaque, non-transparent mud. The old barbarian, meaning the Buddha, said, true thusness does not keep to its own nature, but according to circumstances brings about all phenomenal things. He also said, Proceeding to effect according to circumstances, it extends everywhere. While always here upon this seat of enlightenment, would they deceive people? If you consider quietude right and commotion wrong, then this is seeking the real aspect by destroying the worldly aspect. Seeking nirvana, the peace of extinction, apart from birth and death. Birth is thus and death is thus. What's the fuss? When you like the quiet and hate the hubbub, this is just the time to apply effort. Suddenly, when in the midst of hubbub, you topple the scene of quietude. That power surpasses the meditation seat and cushioned by a million billion times. The clinging to quietude, the attachment to it, the idea of it. The toppling itself comes out of complete silence. So does the hubbub. Are they two? Another one, don't cling to stillness. Once you have achieved peaceful stillness of body and mind, you must make earnest effort. Do not immediately settle down in peaceful stillness. In the teaching, this is called the deep pit of liberation, much to be feared. You must make yourself turn freely, <coughs> like, a like a gourd <coughs> floating on the water. It's this light thing which is tossed moves freely, no obstacles. Which doesn't mean one must start becoming a drifter. It's not meant at all. Just this flexibility, this fluidity of the body-mind to respond and not to be stuck in the idea of consistency. Independent and free, not subject to restraints, entering purity and impurity, 
without being obstructed or sinking down, entering purity or entering impurity, without being obstructed or sinking down. Only then do you have a little familiarity with the school of the patch robe monks. If you just manage to cradle the uncrying child in your arms, what's the use? Parents know that's the best time, cradling the uncrying sleeping child. And all the form of frustration just flows out of one. My God, he's an angel. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't I see that? Wait till he opens his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and his mouth. <laughs> be able to live in the hubbub of that too, not being thrown. All the times one is thrown, sometimes just more than one cope with, can cope with the demands of children, particularly if there are many of them. And yet to get one's footing in the midst of that and to have these eyes clear to see these kids that's why grandparents, most grandparents, can enjoy their grandchildren so much. Because for the time they're with them, they don't have all these ideas. What is he going to be? And is he going to be like this all the rest of his life? <laughs> it's this constant fear. One little thing showing up, oh, that's how he's going to be all his life. So one fixates oneself and the child with those, with those fears. This one is ca called Profound Clarity. I'm giving you the name Chanyan, which is Profound Clarity. A patriarch said, as long as there is mental discrimination, and calculating judgment. All the perceptions of one's own mind are dreams. If mind and consciousness are quiescent and extinct without a single thought stirring, this is called correct awareness. Once awareness is correct, then in your daily life activities, 24 hours a day, when seeing form, hearing sound, smelling scent, tasting flavor, feeling touch, or knowing phenomena, whether walking, standing, sitting, or lying down, whether speaking or silent, active or still, there's nothing that's not profound clarity. And when you don't engage in wrong thinking, meaning biased thinking, partial thinking with this ego point of view, when you don't engage in wrong thinking, all is pure whether there is thinking or not. Thinking itself is not the impurity. There's a place for thinking. Good gracious, if we didn't think properly. Good gracious, we are not thinking properly. That's our problem. But clear thinking is so necessary, so called for in this confused world of only partial thinking. All is pure whether there is thinking or not. Once you've attained purity, when active, you reveal the function of profound clarity. Acting out of clarity is the function of clarity, also called prajna, wisdom. That sounds so heavy, because there 
concepts associated with it. When inactive, you return to the essence of profound clarity. Nothing mysterious about essence and function. It's very simply put here. When active, meaning not active for one's own advantage, but out of seeing what needs to be done, you reveal the function of profound clarity. When inactive, you return to the essence of profound clarity. Though essence and function are distinguished, the profound clarity is one. Like when you cut up sandalwood, each and every piece is sandalwood. Break up an incense stick into 50 pieces, each one can be lit and burn and have a scent. These days, there's a kind of phony whose own standpoint is not genuine. They just teach people to control their minds and sit quietly, to sit to the point where the breath ceases. I call this lot pitiable. Please don't identify with this lot. It means just to try to reach a state of bliss or vacant, vacantness, and to have that purpose in mind at the moment you sit down that goal, that quiet bliss. I'm asking you to meditate in just this way, but though I instruct you like this, it's that there's no other choice in, in terms of working in the midst of activity, which means sitting in the midst of the hubbub of thought to try to see the emptiness of them. Or to allow the emptiness to reveal itself when the little me doesn't meddle with the thoughts which are the little me. It's the me always chasing the me. The me controlling the me. What a confusion. If there really were something to work on in meditation this way, it would defile you. This mind has no real substance. How can you forcibly bring it under control? The forcer is the same stuff as what he or she is trying to force. It's the same stuff. Just an idea that there's a controller and a forcer or a thinker. He or she is the same stuff as what he or she is trying to think, force, or control. Are they two? If you try to bring it, if you try to bring it under control, where do you put it? Since there's no place to put it, there's no times or seasons, no past or present, no ordinary pe people and no sages, no gain or no loss, no quiet and no confusion. There's no name of profound clarity and no essence of profound clarity and no function of profound clarity and no one who speaks thus of profound clarity and no one to hear thus talk of profound clarity. This one is called So Very Close. (laughs) 
just because it's so very close, you cannot get this truth out of your own eyes. When you open your eyes, it strikes you. When you close your eyes, it's not lacking either. If you're blind, it's not lacking either. When you open your mouth, you speak of it. When you shut your mouth, it appears by itself. But if you try to receive it by stirring your mind, your grasping mind, you've already missed it by 18,000 miles. This one is called Two Awakenings. In the old days, the venerable Yen Yang asked Chao Chu as Joshua. What is it like? What is it like when not bringing a single thing? And Joshua said, put it down. Yen Yang said, since not a single thing is brought, put what down? Joshua said, if you can't put it down, pick it up. At these words, Yen Yang was greatly enlightened. Again, a monk asked an ancient worthy, what's it like when the student can't cope, can't cope? The ancient worthy said, I too am like this. The monk said, teacher, why can't you cope either? The ancient worthy said, if I could cope, I could take away this inability to cope of yours. At these words, the monk was greatly enlightened. The enlightenment of these two monks is precisely where you are lost. Where you have doubts is exactly where these two monks ask their questions. Phenomena are born from discrimination, which means in plain language, when you think of something, you make a thing out of it, when you worry over it. Or when you have a concept of emptiness, or a concept of inability, an image of insufficiency, incapability. Wipe out all phenomena of discrimination. Wiping out seeing through this. Or question a moo in the midst of all this discouragement. Or in the midst of this emptiness. Not calling it discouragement or emptiness, but moon, who? Those are no labels. Those are open questions. This Dharma has no birth and no destruction. This one is called, Who is in the way? Your letter informs me that your root nature is dim and dull. 
so that though you make efforts to cultivate and uphold the Dharma, you've never gotten an instant of transcendent enlightenment. <laughs> the one who can recognize dim and dull is definitely not dim and dull. You're really dim and dull, then you're not aware of it. Like this, who said this the other day? Obora. If a madman realizes he's a madman, he's on, a, he's on the way to, to sanity, to wholeness. The one who can recognize dim and dull is definitely not dim and dull. Where else do you want to seek transcendent enlightenment? After all, gentlemen of affairs who study this path must depend on their dimness and dullness to enter. If you don't have any discomfort in your life, you're not going to enter. You're going to continue wallowing in what you think is unending pleasure. What you know very well is not unending pleasure. But if you hold to dimness and dullness, considering yourself to be without the qualifications for the path, then you're being controlled by the demons of dimness and dullness. Since, since those of commonplace understanding often make the intention of seeking transcendent enlightenment, or often make the intention of seeking transcendent enlightenment into an obstacle set before them, their own correct understanding cannot appear before them. You don't give it a chance. As you seek this transcendent enlightenment, And yet, not to take this too literally, as he says, if you hold to dimness and dullness, considering that this, there's no way out, then you're controlled by the demons of dimness and dullness. There must be a real yearning to find out if dimness and dullness can come to an end. And this obstacle does not come from the outside, it's nothing else but the boss man who recognizes the dimness and dullness. Thus, when Master Yu Yen was dwelling constantly in his room, he would call to himself, boss, and also responded, yes, <laughs> be alert, I will. Hereafter, don't fall for people's deceptions, I won't. A much finer translation of this. Zuigan, it's a, it's a koan, Zuigan calling the master, Zuigan saying to himself ever so often, master, yes sir. See clearly, see clearly. Yes, yes. And don't be deceived by others. No, no, I won't. Fortunately, since ancient times, there have been such models. But don't make them your models, but work yourself in this way. Not because they did, but because you must. Because you know the consequences of dimness and dullness. And all that flows from it, the pain to oneself and others. Just arouse yourself right here and see what it is. The one who does the arousing isn't anyone else. He's just the one that can recognize dimness and dullness. Are we a multitude of beings inside or is just one 
one movement, one process of working. And the one who recognizes dimness and dullness isn't anyone else. He's your own fundamental identity. This is me giving medicine to suit the disease, having no other alternative. Briefly pointing out the road for you to return home and sit in peace and that's all. If you stick to dead words and say this is really your fundamental identity, then you're acknowledging the conscious spirit as yourself meaning just this limited consciousness. Images, concepts of oneself. And this has even less to do with it. Therefore, Master Changsha said, people studying the path don't know the truth. It's just because they've always accepted the conscious spirit always accept the justice consciousness as being all there is. This consciousness with everything that fills it up. All the memories, the habits, one's knowledge, one's aspirations, hopes, fears, and what one doesn't know, one's deeper motives, which we call the unconscious, People studying the path don't know the truth. It's just because they've always accepted this consciousness. This, this, this consciousness, the root of birth and death over immeasurable ages, fools call the original man. <laughs> Here's so much today about ex consciousness expansion. It's still consciousness expanded. Or you can contract it. Still consciousness. It's not your own true self, even though it's included in it. But this consciousness cannot see the true self. But the true self, in the true self, there can be awareness of this limited consciousness. the fact of its limitation. What I said before about depending on dimness and dullness to enter is this. Simply see what the one who can know dimness and dullness like this ultimately is. Who is he? Who is she? Who, who, who? Or who? Some people say, when you say that so energetically, I can't do that. You're not supposed to do it that way. Do it your own way. <sighs> or no sound. The form doesn't matter. And there can be energy in no sound. As roaringly as energy in sound. Just look right here. Don't seek transcendent enlightenment. Just observe and observe. Or just question and question. That's what observation means, not knowing. Questioning and questioning. Suddenly you'll laugh aloud. Beyond this there's nothing that can be said. This last one is called One Suchness. One Suchness. 
to take up this great affair. He must have determined well. If you're half believing and half in doubt, then there'll be no connection. An ancient worthy said, studying the path is like drilling for fire. You still can't stop when you get smoke. Only when sparks appear is the return home complete. Want to know where it's complete? It's the worlds of self and the worlds of others as one suchness. there is love and compassion and affection which can do no wrong. Stop here. We will now recite the four vows. 